in a prior life before my prior life, I had been a university professor. And I taught management science. Uh, we called it quantitative methods. And it was a class every student loved. I mean, they just loved all these numerically oriented classes when they were management majors. <laughs> the topics we talked about were things like forecasting. So we did linear regression. We did exponential smoothing. We talked about inventory management, whether that was uh, economic order quantity, material requirements planning, all these different fun things, right? Um, you saw some of that a couple of years ago, or you've seen the video perhaps of the waiting lines presentation that I did. That came from that class, so I've always enjoyed thinking about waiting lines and when you really could restructure this and make it better. This is another one, it's linear programming. Um, we taught that as well, and this was back uh, some years ago. So I wanted to go through how I think through linear programming problems, and maybe if you've never seen it or never done it, or it's been like, what is that stuff? Maybe this will help think through uh, the understanding of what it's really trying to do. And we're going to do it as simple as possible with the graphical method of solving linear program problems. So here we go. It's an approach to optimize an allocation problem. That's what linear programming is. Subject to constraints. Usually those are going to be either to maximize something or minimize something. If you're maximizing, you may be trying to maximize profits. Uh, you don't want to maximize sales. The best way to do that is to sell it for nothing. You don't want to do that. That doesn't always work, though. You can, if you're giving something away, you'll have a lot more than charging ten thousand dollars each for it, probably. But the other side of it is you may want to minimize, minimize cost, uh, and the traveling salesman problem. You're trying to minimize distance or something like that. So there's all sorts of approaches to this. But you can't just make a billion units or whatever. So you know you've got some constraints. Uh, usually you're either trying to maximize or minimize the value of an objective function. A profit per unit, a cost per unit, things like that. Real life problems can be quite immense and are very hard to solve or approximate and coming up with better ways to do this is a, a very big objective of many computer science programmers trying to do this stuff. So what's going on? What is the deal with this? Let's approach it with a fairly simple problem we're going to use using some XY graphs. So let's say we have a company uh, Joseph Horn, you have uh, left the Abbey and you've started a TV company. <laughs> and you're making two models of TV sets. Very marketing oriented as you are, you're calling the first one Model A and the second one Model B. I won't pick on Joe. Two sets, right? A and B. We're making TV sets. The profit for every A is $300 and the profit for every B is $250. Uh, resource constraints exist on the amount of labor you have to make TV sets, we're going to say, and the amount of machine time available. Again, simple problem. So we have 40 hours of labor available. Each A, we're going to say, requires two hours of labor, and each B requires one hour. So you've already got some limitations. You can't make a thousand A's because that would use up all your labor time. Uh, suppose there's 45 hours of machine time available, and each A requires one, each B requires three. So less labor for B, but a lot more of the machine time. Okay, so you know this is only two variables. So I'm thinking, of, what would I do? What's the best mix going to be that would maximize my profits? Joseph loves this problem. Unfortunately, he's going to go back to the Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you also have a sales constraint given by management, and we all know how uh, all the remarks about management, right? Management says you must sell at least eight Model A's or don't come to work tomorrow. So you have to have at least eight A's. I don't care whether six A's might in fact be the best mix. You have this constraint. A has to be eight or greater. So the problem is how many A's and B's are you going to make in order to maximize profit given these constraints? Now, at this time, this is when students would be going, man, I need to change majors, or I want to drop the class. Uh, and today, they'd be texting their girlfriend saying, hey, let's meet for hot dogs, or whatever it may be. So you can write out the problem in a standard form that looks like this. Maximize 300A plus 250B. That's the objective function. You could say, you know, the function of, of A and B, you know, all that kind of stuff. Subject to these constraints, labor can be written out as two times the number of A units plus one times the number of B units has to be less than or equal to 40. Now it's unlikely that that'll be equal to zero because then you're not making anything. 
So it's going to be, you know, probably up close to 40, you would expect. But you've got another one. 1A plus 3B has to be less than or equal to 45. That's your machine time constraint. You have this constraint that says, hey, A, management says A has to be greater than or equal to 8. And you can't have B be negative. You know, I don't, it, mathematically, maybe it would work where the best thing is to make several billion A's and minus several million B's. <laughs> that doesn't work. You can't do that. Now, there's also an implied thing here that you can have fractional units. Okay? Integer programming makes it even more real world where you have to have a whole A. You know, you can't turn off the machine when a sixth of a unit's spitting out of the end of it. It doesn't work. But for our purposes, let's pretend that we simply finish the unit, come back the next day or the next week. This is the first step. And many times now, this is the important step formulating the problem because you can feed it into other things to do it, right? But we're going to do it with graphs so that we can know what the machine, uh, the computer, whatever is doing to solve the problem. So what do we do now? Well, we get out our piece of paper like I did not too long ago, and we start writing out the graph to try to figure this one out. So I just did my X and Y's. I got zero there where it crosses. Although A is going to be on my x-axis, purely arbitrary, B is on the vertical axis. The quadrants on the graph, three of them are not possible areas where the solution can be found. The x over here would be where the a's are negative. That's not allowed. The uh, x down at the bottom is where b's are negative, and the bottom corner, that third quadrant over there, is where they're both negative. So where's my answer going to be? And I you'd think students would know. It's got to be over there, right? It's got to be over there. So you can only produce in that top right quadrant. So graph the first constraint. Well, the first constraint is 2a plus b less than or equal to 40, but what, the way we do it is we graph the line. Don't worry about the inequality yet. Graph the equality portion of it. Don't worry about the inequality. So I always got two points by simply sticking a zero in for one of the variables and figuring out what the other one is. That means it's going to be on the corner, uh, on the uh, uh, axes, right? So if you have zero A right here, what's B, right? It's got to be 40. So that's going to be the point up there on my graph, zero comma 40. What do I do next? Well, you put in a zero for B and solve for A. So in this case, 2a plus b equals, it is just plain old algebra. It's easy algebra. There's no squares in here. If you put b equal to 0, then a has to be equal to 20. So that's 20 comma 0 down there. The line is simply connecting the dots, right? Connecting the dots. You just simply connect the dots. There you go. Now, that's where it's equal to 40. The Inequality says it's got to be less than that, so it's got to be inside that part of the triangle that it just formed. Okay? Do the same thing with the machine time constraint. That was A, 1A, plus 3B equals 45. When A is equal to 0, what's B? Well, 45 divided by 3, 15. So I've got 0, 15 on the B graph. B is 15, A is 0. And then you substitute in a zero for the other uh, uh, for the other variable. When b is zero, a's got to be 45, so it's way out there. And then what am I going to do? Connect my dots, right? Connect my dots. There you go. Which side of that is the actual inequality? Well, it's got to be less than 45, so it's got to be out here. And if for some reason that wasn't uh, something I could just tell, pick a point out there, right? 100 comma 100 is certainly going to be out that way. And so stick in 100, 100 and see if it's less than 40. See if it's less than 45. And if it's greater than 40 or 45, well, I know that can't be it. So, you know, trial and error is encouraged when we're trying to do the graphical method just to make sure we're looking at the right stuff. So we have restricted the area of the solution already. Where is it right now? It's in this thing, this trapezoid. Is that what that is? Trapezoid? It has to be, well, I don't have the last constraint in there, right? Management has entered the picture. You must sell eight. So I have that one. Okay, it's always good in this case, though, to label the constraint lines. <laughs> you get a lot of constraints. Uh, labor machine, labor machine. So I'm now going to do the sales constraint or the management constraint. It said we had to sell eight or more Model A's, so I just did eight comma zero, 
And where it's equal to 8, because you don't care what B is when A is equal to 8, it's just a straight vertical line. Suppose management had a constraint that said you had to sell no more, no more than 20 Bs. What would I have done with that? Horizontal line from where? Here at 20 going that way, right? Which side of that would have been with me saying no more than 20? Down here, right? Down here. So I've actually sh uh, shaved off a portion of that trapezoid-like thingy. Okay, so where's the feasible region, the feasible solution area? It's that inside part. And I always encourage people, look, scribble in on it so you don't forget where it is. That, because you come back to it, what was I doing, right? That's where we want to be. The shaded region is the feasible solution space. But there's still an infinite number of points in that shaded solution space. Which one am I looking for that will optimize or maximize the objective function so I make the most money? Well, an important hint, the solution is always a corner of the space with only one exception. We'll talk about that. It's always a corner of the trapezoid with one exception. So, what are the corners? Well, the easy corner, corner number one is easy, right? That's just eight comma zero. So we come up here, two, three, four. I used to always like to just use Roman numeral, numerals for it. That way I didn't get it confused with the dots on my little graph. What's corner two right there? Corner two is an intersection of two lines. It's an intersection of two lines. The sales constraint going vertically and that machine time constraint. And this is where they always hated me. You remember in like the seventh or eighth grade where you had to find the intersection of two lines? You had two options. And points, imaginary points to whoever remembers both options. What were the approaches to find the value of the intersection of two lines? They both had method in the name. Okay. The addition method. Anybody remember that? And the substitution method. You would have to learn them again. <laughs> the addition method and the substitution method. For the addition method, you take two equations and you multiply one of the equation by some number so that when you add it to the other equation, one of the variables disappears. Suppose you had x plus y equal 10 and then you had... Um, x plus 2y equals 20. Well, if you, you have to multiply the bottom one to get rid of x like negative 1. If you do the same thing to both sides of an equation, you can add it and you're still good because you're adding equal things. And since it's an intersection, both equations have to be equal where they cross. So the addition method or the substitution method. So let, let's see about corner 2. Whoops. Corner 2 over here. For corner two, I decided on the substitution method. Why? Because I know full well that one of those values is equal to eight. For corner two, it is the vertical line, right? It was the sales line for corner two. So I know it's the intersection of where A is eight and where A plus three B equals 45. So I plug in eight for A. So it's eight plus three B equals 45. Subtract it over to the other side. Three B equals 37, I hope. And then you divide by 3 on both sides. B is equal to 12.33. There's that fractional stuff. So this corner 2 is going to be 8, 12.33. What about corner 3? Corner 3 is a little harder because it's the intersection of the machine time and the um, labor constraint. So it's where A plus 3B equal 45 and then 2A plus B equal 50. So what I did is I rearranged the... Uh, bottom equation, this equation, to get B by itself. How did I do it? Remember algebra stuff? Yeah, I know y'all were paying attention in the 8th grade. Subtract 2A onto the other side over there so you get B equals 40 minus 2A. Well, look at that. B shows up in the top equation, doesn't it? But we know B has to be equal to 40 minus 2A. And when they're crossing, both equations have to be equal. So it actually, this top equation becomes A plus 3 times 40 minus 2A equals 45, and then you just start rearranging to get A equals 15. Well, once you get A equals 15, you plug it back in. And so you plug it back in up at the top, 15, which is what A was, plus 3B equals 45, B is 10. It's really not that hard. You can, depending on how nasty the two, cons, uh, cons, two lines look, you can choose to do the substitution method if it looks easy. 
If it's nasty, you can uh, do the addition method. It's not that hard to do. I mean, I remember weeks and weeks of this stuff had to be in like the seventh grade. And I was trying to show the students high school algebra really was important because that's what we're trying to do to solve this problem. So we had 15 comma 10. So then you go back to the graph and you plug them in. This one we found by the substitution method, plugging in 8 to the other equation when it was on the machine equation. The third one was the intersection here of the labor uh, constraint and the machine time constraint. We got 15 comma 10. This one's also easy. We already had that point, that corner on the graph, 20 comma 0. So one of those four points is the answer. So I don't have to worry about an you know, infinite number of possible solutions. There are that many possible. One of these four is the best. I, if, if zero zeros in here, that's obviously not going to be the best for a maximization, but we don't have that one. So what do you do now? I zoom in on it so you can see it a little better. And yes, that was actually just hand drawn on uh, the piece of paper. Took pictures every time I drew a new line of the same little thing. Somebody told me I should have done Excel and looked down on me when I didn't do it, do the graphs. But nobody would look down on me. But the whole point was I was just trying to do it quickly. I'm trying to do it quickly. So you substitute the coordinates of each corner into the objective function. And you see which one's the largest. And that will be your answer because you're trying to maximize the objective function. So the first one, you plug in 8 comma 0 into that. It's going to be 2,400. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I did 0 comma 0. This should be, <laughs> you don't make mistakes when you turn in your work. This should be 8 up here, 8 comma 0. 3,300 times 8, 2,400. So the value at corner 1, 8 comma 0, not 0 comma 0, the way I have up there, is 2,400. Then you plug in 8 comma 12.33. So it's 8 times 300, 2,400 plus 250 times 12.33, the profit there is 5482. Should it be 12 instead of 12.33? You can't have 12.33 machines. Yes, you can. we're doing linear programming and fractional units are allowed. Oh. You, you don't solve it this way if you were going to restrict things to integers. That gets more complicated. All right. So it's probably somewhere around there, right? <laughs> You know, you, you, I'm sure in reality you probably make 12. Um, then you plug in corner three. Um, corner three, you've got 15 comma 10, 300 times 15 plus 250 times 10. So corner three turns out to be $7,000. And corner four, 20 comma zero is just six. So of those four, it's $7,000. It's the corner out there in the middle, which it almost always is. Right? Now... I said it's one, the, one of the corners nearly all the time. It's not one of the corners if because the, the objective function up here, 300A plus uh, 250B, that actually represents a line too. And the slope of that line yeah, can be plotted and you can move that slope out and the last corner that it touches will be the answer. The problem is what if the slope happens to be exactly this? Any work. point on that line would actually work if it satisfied the other constraints. Yeah. So it's possible, and sometimes it could have been anywhere in here. If the slope of the uh, objective function looked like that, it could have been anywhere on here. But that's very rare. The odds of that happening where the slope of the objective function is exactly the slope of one of the constraints are very remote. So I usually didn't even tell them. <laughs> Because then they would just pick something out. All right, so that's all linear programming is. Graphs, just in high school algebra. So there's your answer. 15A and 10B for a profit of $7,000. Uh, Joe's worry about fractional TV units is not something we have to worry about. 15As uh, and 10Bs. I don't think that was all that hard. Really don't. So what if a problem has 30 variables and 50 constraints? <laughs> okay. I always imagine a computer doing a very complicated graph, and I'm really glad it can keep all that stuff straight in its head. Okay, but if I think about it in terms of two variables, I can let the complicated stuff be done by a computer that can do it a whole lot better than I can. But if I understand the two and I think about the concepts here, 
then when I'm looking at the results a computer spits out of some huge, immense, complicated problem, then, okay, it just did something a lot better than I would have been able to do. Yes, Excel can do it, but so can you. So that's the exact problem that we did before. Uh, laid out in Excel, it has a solving method, and you can use simplex linear programming of two variables, it's overkill. But it came up, as you can see up here, with 15 A's and 10 B's. So you can do them in Excel, but you know, if you don't understand what it's doing, then that becomes a black box. And if you're using a black box, you don't know when you've made a mistake. You don't know whether to accept what comes out or not, if you don't have you know, some kind of an idea of what's happening. Uh, the 41CL and the DM41X can also do this. There's actually a simplex ROM, so you can run that exact linear programming problem on the 41. I've done that. It's, it's kind of fun to do. You've got to key in a whole lot of different little numbers. But it can get the answer to this just as easily as Excel can. It takes a little longer. Let's look at a, a couple of other questions on this. What if you can add an hour of machine time? If you could add an hour of machine time, would that help you? Would you make more money? Well, where's the machine time constraint? Right here, right? And the answer was here. So if you added an hour, what would happen to that constraint? It'd go out this way a little bit, right? So almost certainly it's going to be a little bit more of a TV you could make. So you should be able to make more money. Linear programming analysis will calculate the value of one incremental unit added to a constraint. They call that a dual price, D-U-A-L, but it really is just the value of one more unit. Suppose that was $5 for machine time. The, rev the revenue was $5. Well, then you got to say, what's my cost? If my cost is 10, don't do it, right? Don't do it. But if you generate $200 and your cost is only 20, then yeah. You can do that kind of analysis. How much is it worth for one more unit? Same thing for uh, labor, right? You have to say, how much more would you make if it were no cost? And then compare that gain to your cost. So that tells you how much more the max you would pay to add an hour of availability of the constraint. Because the constraints are what kept us from not making more money, right? We ran out of machine time and labor. And the answer would not go that way. It would have moved up on this line, right? Because it would have come up here. We would have had a little less A, a little more B, if we had an additional unit of uh, machine time. This one's going to be quicker, I promise, because I want to show you a minimization problem and show you that really it's the same thing. Really it's the same thing. So here we go. In blending a paint, how's this for going to be simplified? I know paints aren't blended this way. Uh, it has to have a brightness of at least 300 counts. I'm not going to define what that is. <laughs> and has to have a hue level of at least 250 counts, which amazingly are determined entirely by two ingredients, alpha and beta. We're going to call those, I don't know, let's say A and B. Okay, A and B. Alpha and beta both add one count of brightness for each unit. So if you add an alpha unit, you get one count of brightness. Add a beta, you get one count of brightness. Hue is controlled only by alpha. And at every unit of hue that you add, you get three counts of, uh, every unit of alpha you add, you get three counts of hue added to the blend. Alpha costs 45 cents per unit and beta costs 15. What's the problem I'm trying to do here? Per unit. What? You said... Beta costs 50. 50, 45 cents, sorry. 45 cents per unit is the cost, and beta costs 12 cents per unit. What's my, what am I trying to do here? I'm not trying to maximize money. I'm trying to blend it as cheaply as I can. How little actual food can I put in those Cheetos? <laughs> so the problem is how many units you put into the mix in order to get the required brightness and the, the required hue or color as cheaply as possible. Cheaply as possible. So you can write it out like this. Minimize 45 cents for every alpha plus minimize 12 cents for every beta. Subject to, I got to have at least 300 units of brightness. It's okay if it's more than that. And that brightness comes from each unit of alpha and each unit of beta. A plus B has to be at least 300. At least 300. Hue has to be at least 45. Hopefully that's the right number. 
What was it over there? You said 50 when you were talking about it. 250. Oh, rats. It didn't seem right. Pretend that there's an extra. There's 250 there. It's not actually showing 45. I, I'm curious to see what I did on the paper as I was drawing this out. I probably did it wrong. A has to be greater than zero in this case. You can't throw in negative alpha to the, how do you add it? negative units to your mix? B has to be greater than zero. Can't use negative beta in there. So what do you do now? You graph the lines. You don't worry about the inequalities. Graph where it's equal to the thing and then figure out which side of the line we're talking about. And then find the corners to find the cheapest blend. I bet I did it wrong. These things are, again, these regions are not, it's always in the positive quadrant. So you draw the line from the brightness constraint. That's easy. A plus B equals 300. So 0 comma 300, 300 comma 0, connect the dots. Okay, connect the dots. This one's a little different. Did I do that one right? Why do I have 200 divided by 3? It should be whatever the required amount of... <laughs> Sorry about this, Al. What, how much, I said it was 250. It should be 250 divided by 3. Does that actually work out to 83.33? It's amazing. You get the right answer even if the inputs are wrong. No, no, coffee. Or too much. Too much coffee. That, that's helpful. Okay, I had some typos, but the line at least is right. So that's it, right? Where's the feasible region? Let's ask this. Maybe, is it here? No. Why would it not be here? Not bright enough. It's, it doesn't have enough of this, right? It's got to be at least more than that. It's got to be out that way. So it can't be here. What about here? Still not bright enough. This is the color, right? It's not bright enough. What about up here? Wrong it's color. bright enough, right? It's bright enough, but it's not enough color. So it's got to be out here, right? It's got to be out that way. But I don't want to be a million comma one million or what? I go bankrupt. So how many corners are there? This is a corner, right? 300 comma zero over there. Yeah. There's this one. Where is the corner of that? Never mind. Get out your prime to solve for that one. So I got two corners, right? Label them one and two, and I got the region shaded in out there. So I really just have to solve for that, right? I got to solve for number one. One of these two corners is the answer that will minimize the cost of the ingredients and still get my requirements of color and brightness. So what do I do? I substitute them in, right? 83, this is 83 comma 216. How do I know that? It's got to be where it's equal to 300. This is 83. What's 300 minus 83? 216. Substitute it in. And so you solve for it, right? 45 cents times the amount of alpha, 83.33. Plus 12 cents times the number of beta, 216, $63.50 for the mix. Over here, and wow, that's crazy. 300 alphas times 300 plus 12 times 0, 135. I'm not doing that. That's what the previous paint company did, and they're not here anymore. So my solution would be, in this case, to minimize my cost to be at point corner one. That's all linear programming is, whether it's got a thousand constraints and variables or not. The computer's just doing that kind of thing to max or min in its innards. In its innards. Questions on graphical linear programming? Yes, sir, Richard. I understand that there's a way to transform a problem. Uh, suppose, suppose, for example, suppose you have, for example, you have five variables and only two constraints. And, and, you, and, you, and, and you're trying to minimize your objective function. There's a way to transform that to where you maximize an objective function of a different problem that has, that has five constraints and two variables, which you can easily do graphically. That is correct. And that how correct. do you do that? That will be the subject of a talk next year. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, there's... The, to do the way, if you do it by hand, you're using matrix functions. That's why the matrix ROMs and the CCD had all these. You could write simplex programs to do that stuff. Uh, and it really, again, it's doing things by minimizing a tap blow and all this kind of stuff. And there's plenty of other things too. You can't do five variables on a graph, but if you, you know, with two constraints, you can kind of flip the thing and change it. That's a, that's an interesting trick. There's other programming models. We already talked about integer. <laughs> Right? That's really important. 
Because as Joe said, how can you do a third of the TV? But there's also uh, dynamic programming. Oh, what do you do good. when it's got uh, powers? Right? But there are important things for this. The traveling salesman <laughs> problem is a big deal. How do you get to everywhere you got to go, either as fast as possible or as cheaply as possible? And UPS and FedEx delve into that all the time. You ever notice with the UPS, I think it's UPS trucks, they never turn left. But they do. They're not, seen, they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. They get reported. <laughs> okay. But they, they try to analyze, what's the route? What's the route? I'm going to go visit 200 child care facilities over the next couple of months. If I were going to do that, you, know, you don't want to go to one side of the county and then go back to the office and then go to the other. You know, how do I minimize what's the best way? That's all this kind of stuff that computers are so much more advanced than they were in the 80s. But it's really just kind of doing a big graph in its head. And that's good enough for me. Right. Yes, sir, Rich. One other question. I, I understand there's there's an algorithm whose performance beats linear programming called elliptical programming, but it's only for very large problems. Do you know what scale of, pro of problem? I don't. Uh, I mean, there, again, there's a whole industry. There are people that are paid big dollars to come up with faster ways finding ways to get to a solution in a 1% better, faster, fewer steps, things like that, because that's a big deal. Uh, I simply tried to get you know, young minds out the door so they might remember sometime in the future, I remember something about some sort of programming. I would call that a victory. So anyway, I just wanted to share this with you. It may not have been as much fun as thinking about people standing in line at the slow still service, but I uh, uh, do see Thomas in the back. Is this going to be on the quiz? Yes, yeah, Steve. It'll be on, uh, it'll be on uh, Bob's quiz next year, Steve. All right, thanks, everybody.